mechanical signaling in animal cells, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. And um, I've tried to cover a bro you know, the, the major topics that you're going to hear about in careers in mechanobiology. Uh, some will be at a higher level, but I'm also going to try to summarize the salient points of each of the topics. <clears throat> so let me say um, introduction to mechanical elements of animal cells. Half of the mechanical elements are outside of the cell in the extracellular matrix, and we're not going to talk about that. Becky's going to talk about that tomorrow. Uh, we're going to concentrate on the cells themselves. And so, and that leads us to these concepts of adhesion receptors and mechanosensitive signaling pathways. So here's an overview of um, what we're going to talk about. Um, so, and some fundamental principles. Adhesion receptors are plasma membrane receptors. So they have an extracellular side that goes out to the um, environment where they bind to extracellular matrix proteins or other receptors. And then they have a transmembrane domain across the plasma membrane and then a cytosolic domain inside the cell. So the extracellular domain binds to extracellular matrix, commonly abbreviated ECM. And we're going to talk about two classes of these receptors. One, the integrins, which is the major receptor to bind to the ECM. And um, Adhesion receptors also bind to other cells, and they attach cells and transmit mechanical information back and forth. And we're going to talk about a major category of that called coherence. Let's see if I can tilt this a little better. OK, and the inside of these adhesion receptors bind to the cytoskeleton. In particular, we're going to emphasize the actin cytoskeleton. Oh, and I didn't specify it, but you know, in case I didn't catch this, uh, adhesion receptors are proteins. Um, so adhesion receptors, in, the, in a sense, link the, um, ex the mechanical information that's either in the ECM or an adjacent cell into the cell itself. Okay? And that information transfer uh, leads to this term that's uh, called mechanotransduction, uh, which is a very popular term. You're going to hear that word kicked around a lot. Mechanotransduction is the conversion of mechanical information into chemical information. Sometimes mechanical, mechanotransduction does not necessarily involve a chemical intermediate. Uh, mechanical signal in the extracellular matrix, for example, could regulate the actin cytoskeleton and open pores in the nucleus. And there could be a, a simple mechanical um, signaling pathway. But in, in many cases, mechanical signals are transduced into a chemical signal. So this first category of uh, adhesion receptors, integrins, um, they they connect, as I said, the ECM to the actin cytoskeleton. They regulate force transduction. They sense the rigidity uh, of the extracellular matrix, things like collagen and fibronectin and things you're going to hear more about tomorrow. We're going to talk about a few of those elements today as it relates to how the adhesion receptors detect these ligands. So the extracellular matrix is another word, ligand. Um, is what a receptor binds to, right? So it, extracellular matrix proteins or non-proteinaceous components of the matrix that have receptors, those are all considered ligands. Um, if you look at this cartoon, so here is the outside of an integrin. You see it's rather large, and here's the plasma membrane and the transmembrane domain, and here is the cytoplasmic tail of the integrins, you can see it's rather small. So um, it's a small intracellular domain. Most receptors uh, that are well understood, for example, growth factor receptors or cytokine receptors, uh, have enzymatic activity. Their cytoplasmic domain is a kinase, often a tyrosine kinase. But integrins and also coherins lack 
enzymatic activity themselves. So they have to work in another way. And the way you're going to see how they work is they recruit kinases to those cytoplasmic uh, domains. The other thing I'll point out, I think comes up again, is that there's a, a, a gold. These are different uh, protein subunits, the gold and the red. So integrins are composed of what are called alpha and beta subunits. So um, there is, a, there is a principle in integrin biology called activation. Integrins generally uh, or often are in an inactive um, configuration. And these, uh, these data are representative of structural biology models, um, often through X-ray crystallography or NMR. So the inactive integrin exists in sort of this floppy state. So here's that plasma membrane, the cytosolic domain, the extracellular domain. And they're the two chains here in green and purple. And when they activate, they enter into this higher affinity state that's characterized by this straightening out of these two extracellular chains. And I want to draw particular attention to these cytoplasmic tails because you see here they're close together and here in the activated receptor they're separated. <laughs> and that's really important because this separation is what allows proteins in the cytoplasm to come and bind to these cytoplasmic tails and start the process of signal transduction. Um, there, I think we don't have to go over this. There are certain motifs that are in these cytoplasmic tails that bind. There are two proteins that you may hear about called talin and kindlin. Uh, kindlin is a family. These are proteins that bind to these cytoplasmic domains and start this process of integrin activation. So separation of the cytoplasmic domains during activation. Um, this is the, this binding site over here is where talin binds to integrins. And there's a cooperation between kindlins and talins in integrin activation that is still not fully understood. So um, as I said, integrins are two chains of alpha and beta. They're heterodimers, and they form um, in different combinations. And these different combinations of alpha and beta subunits is what confers ligand specificity. So the reason that a certain integrin binds to collagen and another integrin binds to fibronectin is because they have different combinations of their alpha and beta subunits. And I'll bring up a couple uh, terms that you'll also hear a lot in the mechanobiology field. RGD, this is a tripeptide sequence, arginine, glycine, aspartic acid. Um, this is found in the ligands of um, several ECM proteins. Uh, we're going to talk about it in fibronectin. And these are integrins that recognize RGD sequences in their uh, protein ligands. Other, so you can see, for example, uh, two of the most well-studied integrins, alpha-5, beta-1, alpha-V, uh, beta-3. Those are two different receptors for fibronectin. Both of them recognize this RGD sequence. Okay, another protein, alpha-1, beta-1, alpha-2, beta-1. These are collagen receptors that do not recognize the RGD sequence. So you'll often hear about a term RGD binding integrins, referring to this whole category. There's another large category of integrins that do not use the beta-1 subunit. So beta-1, you see, is shared between a lot of different alpha subunits. But there is um, another category of mostly hematopoietic uh, integrins. So on leukocytes, macrophages, um, T cells that use a beta-2 subunit. These are not going to really be discussed here. I'm going to allude to them a tiny bit. But it's a, it's a pretty distinct biology from what um, is commonly studied with beta-1 or beta-3 integrins. I, I want to sort of you know, emphasize this is a, a forum where I would welcome your interruptions, OK? 
It's more important you get your questions than I actually finish all the slides. So any questions so far? Sure. On your previous slide, yeah. um, So sometimes activation is caused by um, a soluble factor that activates the actin cytoskeleton, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And then it go, what's, that leads to this conformational change. Other times it's, it can be regulated by divalent cation concentrations. And as you recognize a ligand extracellularly, that's also thought to trigger it. So there are lots of different ways. Um, some cells have their integrins activated all the time. Um, or at least when we isolate them in the laboratory, their, their integrins are isolated. Most of the, for example, fibroblasts, or I work a lot on smooth muscle cells, these integrins are active all the time. Blood cell integrins are almost never active because you don't want your blood cells sticking to extracellular matrix in your body. So there's a whole field of how you activate hematopoietic cell integrins. Keep going? OK. So I want to talk. So this is a schematic of fibronectin. So fibronectin is uh, actually a dimer of two of these things. So it's a big protein. And I, I think Becky's going to talk some more about fibronectin. Um, I'm going to talk about only two things on fibronectin. Um, and they're here in what's called the cell binding domain. These, these red ovals are, represent a, a sequence homology. They're called repeats. Um, and if I amplify this a little bit, in this uh, ninth and tenth repeat, there are these two sequences. Over here is this, on the right, is this RGD sequence that I was telling you about before uh, that all these are, you know, integrins recognize. But then a little bit end terminal to that, there is this KSSPHSRN. This is called another sequence that particularly recognizes a subset of fibronectin binding integrins. You'll, it has the name of what's called the synergy site. And the reason this is important is because some integrins recognize just this and don't use this alpha, uh, I think, do I have that? Yeah, so here, the fibronectin synergy site reinforces cell adhesion and mediates crosstalk between integrin classes. I don't expect you to read this. I just wanted to show you, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit. If you're binding to fibronectin through an integrin called alpha V beta 3, you recognize the RGD site, and that's it. If you're binding through alpha 5 beta 1, you have to have the synergy site in order to strengthen the binding um, into a, a stable um, adhesion, and that is a force-dependent event. So the mechanobiology of alpha V beta 3 and alpha 5 beta 1 are different because alpha 5 beta 1 requires this second site and alpha V beta 3 does not. A lot of studies in the literature, you'll read that they have used this RGD sequence. Um, they conjugated it to a platform as a ligand for cells to bind, that really restricts the analysis to the category of integrins that do not use the synergy site. So the bottom line here is that subtle differences in the composition of the ECM protein can affect which integrins are being activated. Yeah? So when you say it's force dependent, you mean uh, if the fibronectin is being pulled on or if the stiffness is harder, there are certain domains that are exposed in the fibronectin? Exactly. Yes. And if alpha, v beta, if alpha 5 beta 1 does not engage the synergy site, then it, its bond strength is low. So it forms a weak adhesion. If it engages the synergy site, its bond strength is higher. So here, I, wanna, I highlighted a couple things. These people have actually made a mouse, which was prepping for this lecture very, I did not know this, but it is, they have made a mouse where they have deleted the synergy site from fibronectin and started asking what's the relative importance of alpha 5 versus alpha V. And you know, they said that basically um, the addition, the, there's not a big deficit in the sense that these mice are viable, they can breed, there's a mild platelet adhesion and bleeding deficit if you can't efficiently engage alpha 5. 
but um, down here, the, the, in the synergy site is dispensable for the initial contact with RGD, but essential to reinforce the binding of alpha 5 beta 1 to fibronectin. Okay. Uh, this other integrin, two, alpha 2b beta 3, is another one of those integrins that needs the synergy site. So here's a little bit of data uh, from that paper. Here they're looking at cell adhesion, and the blue is the, purple is the wild type, and the orange red is the one that lacks the synergy site. You can see sort of over time, the adhesion is pretty similar. Um, so is the number of focal adhesions, which I'll explain in a minute. But if you look at the ability to phosphorylate mechanosensitive proteins, which I'll show you in a minute, that's dramatically affected if you remove the synergy site. Okay, so uh, we had this question about how you activate and integrins and the biology, and I, I want to get across two more jargony terms you hear in this field. Um, inside-out signaling and outside-in signaling. So inside-out signaling is that there's some intracellular mechanism by which integrins are activated so they combine the ECM. Okay, a, a classic example of this are uh, things like vasoconstrictors that organize the actin cytoskeleton and strengthen the actin cytoskeleton. We'll talk a little bit about that. And that leads to integrin activation. From in, it's a, it's a soluble chemical binds to a receptor, leads to activation of a protein called Rho, organizes actin, activates the integrin. The signal goes in, then comes back out to get an active receptor. Outside in signaling is more like how does the information in the ECM get transduced into the integrin that leads to set signaling downstream of the receptor. When you have outside-in signaling, you generate what are called focal adhesions. You're going to hear a lot in mechanobiology about focal adhesions. And they are these very attractive green things at the periphery of cells. The red in this picture is actin, and the green that's decorating the tips of these actin fibers are focal adhesion proteins. Focal adhesions contain a cluster of signaling molecules. These are those signaling molecules that are recruited to the integrin cytoplasmic tail that I was referring to. Remember, they don't have a kinase activity, but they recruit and, um, signaling molecules that have activity. We're going to talk more about that. I also just want to mention that focal adhesions are actually the mature stage of an adhesion uh, what's called adhesion plaque. You start at something very small called focal contact. They look, if these look like paintbrush strokes, the green focal contacts will look like dots. Okay, but they have talon. Remember that's one of the initial activation events. Then as proteins get recruited to them, um, they are called focal complexes. You don't have to worry about these terminology, but the point is the, the complexity of the molecules associated with the integrin tail is increasing. And then finally, they mature to focal adhesions. And these are force-dependent events. This is not a force-dependent event in general. Um, there is another adhesion system I'm just going to mention in this one slide called a potosome. I said I'd talk a little bit about hematopoietic cells. So potosomes are, are seen in hematopoietic cells. And this is what a potosome looks like. And you can see it's very different from what a focal adhesion looks like. <laughs> okay. So a potosome, but some of the components are the same. Green is talon, red is F-actin, but you have this ring kind of structure. Okay. Um, and what a, a, a very well-known mechanobiology lab called Mike Sheets's lab uh, showed that um, potosomes and focal adhesions are actually interconvertible in a hematopoietic cell. And it depends upon uh, the activation of this rho GTPases and force. And you can, write, you can switch these um, adhesion sites from a potosome-like structure to a focal adhesion-like structure. We're not going to talk any more about potosomes. I just think it's something you should know about. Not all cells have focal adhesions. So again, we're back to focal adhesions. This is a very outdated picture of focal adhesions, which already looks enormously complex. The current thinking is that there are hundreds of proteins in a focal adhesion. And many of these are kinases. 
And so some of the pathways that are downstream of integrin activation affect a lot of different things. You don't have to memorize or learn any of these different players right now, but the point is cell survival, proliferation, differentiation, migration, all these different biological events can be affected by the adhesive state of the cell, okay, working through some of these proteins. We're going to talk about FAC, focal adhesion, kinase. Uh, but before we do that, um, for those of you who have not had a biology background, there's, a, there's an important concept in uh, signal transduction, which is the fact that proteins have amino acid sequences that are now identifiable that they're going to recruit other specific types of proteins. So, for example, there's the, the thing called the SH2 domain. If you have a protein with an SH2 domain-like sequence, it's going to bind to other proteins that have a phosphorylated tyrosine. If you have a protein with a SH3 domain, and here's a protein that has both, then it's going to bind to other proteins that have a proline-rich sequence. So I don't have to go through this whole list, but you can see that now we have the ability to look at a primary sequence of a protein and identify these motifs and predict what kind of proteins they're going to be able to recruit. Uh, this, this principle goes well beyond the focal adhesion to all protein-protein interactions. But it's a really important concept in signaling because this is the way focal adhesion complexes are built up. So let's talk about that um, in regards to FAC, focal adhesion kinase, which is probably the best studied of the signaling proteins in a focal adhesion. So this is a, a schematic of FAC, and there's one site here, tyrosine 397. Again, these numbers aren't important at all, but this is what's called the autophosphorylation site. So when integrins um, like uh, come are clustered, which is a required event in receptors, the um, one FAC binds to this. T uh, hold on a second. Yeah. SARC binds to this, um, I'm having a moment here. Let me just back up, clear my thoughts. Okay, FAC is a kinase. It is a tyrosine kinase. That's why I go with focal adhesion kinase. Like all receptors, integrins have to cluster to signal. And they are clustered by the actin cytoskeleton in focal adhesions. FAC binds to integrins. And when those integrins cluster, because FAC is a tyrosine kinase, it will phosphorylate a tyrosine residue on an adjacent FAC. That was, you know, each integrin, for example, has a FAC. They're brought together. This FAC says, I'm going to phosphorylate the FAC over here. It, that is called autophosphorylation. It's really in trans as opposed to cis for those who have chemical backgrounds. But it's a autophosphorylation in the sense that it's phosphorylating an, itself, a, a FAC. So this site, tyrosine 397, is that autophosphorylation site. But this site starts a really important cascade. So this, is, this phosphorylation is mediated by SPAC itself. But now we have a <coughs> phosphotyrosine. Remember, phosphotyrosines bind to SH2 domains. And one of the best known SH2 domain containing proteins is SARC which is another tyrosine kinase. So SARC will bind through its SH2 domain to autophosphorylated SARC, the FAC, and now it will start phosphorylating a whole bunch of SARC sites. Here, 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 here. And then each of these sites will start recruiting other molecules. And this is a, a really nice visualization of how you can build up the complexity. Because these molecules could have an SH3 domain, which would then recruit polyprotein, polyproline, polyproline proteins. And um, those polyproline proteins could have SH2 domains, which would then recruit further phosphotyrosine-containing proteins. So the clustering of integrins results in FAC transphosphorylation at this autophosphorylation site. That's a binding site for SARC, which then continues the phosphorylation, and then you build up the, the, the composition of the focal adhesion. And that mechanosensing, by, uh, in fact, is mechanosensitive. So here we're looking at cells that were stretched, 
and you can see that the phosphorylation of fat is increasing with time of stretching, whereas the total abundance of fat is constant. Here we're changing the stiffness of the extracellular matrix, and you can see that the FAC autophosphorylation site is increased with stiffness. I can't read where we are here, this lane versus this lane. And here's another protein, CAS, which um, has been uh, interrogated in this really nice paper, now several years old, uh, where they took a recombinant CAS and put <laughs> probes on its end so it could stretch. And so when they, stre when they put this molecule under force by stretching it, they revealed a cryptic uh, tyrosine, phosphor tyrosine phosphorylatable site in the inner domain of CAS. And that tyrosine phosphorylatable site was then phosphorylated by SARC. And here you can see the phosphorylation of that site with separation of the N and C terminus of CAS. So what would then separate the N and C terminus of CAS biologically? It's the stress that's imposed upon a cell in the focal adhesion. Okay. And then finally, quickly to go into the nucleus, because I want to get on to coherence a little bit, there are transcription factors that are mechanosensitive that respond to these changes in focal adhesion formation with stiffness or stretch. One of the best known is YAP. It's actually called the transcriptional coactivator. It lives in the cytoplasm. And when cells spread or when they're exposed to a rigid extracellular matrix or when they're stretched, um, YAP is translocated from the cytoplasm into the nucleus where it binds a category of transcription factors called TEED and now regulates transcriptional events. So this is a, a underlying principle of how the change in the mechanical information either in the extracellular matrix or imposed by stretch or compression can change the focal adhesion and signal all the way into the nucleus and regulate gene expression. Another similar one is called MRTF. Uh, we don't have to go about the details. It lives in the cytoplasm. When actin is polymerized into F-actin under stress or under force, MRTF translocates into the, cytop into the nucleus and regulates transcription. Okay, so now I want to talk about a different category. Let me take a break here. Um, that was a very quick survey of integrins. Any other questions? OK, so cells talk to each other through adhesion receptors, not only to the ECM. And there are several receptors that mediate cell-cell adhesion. There are tight junction proteins. These are what they're, they are. They, they are, do exactly what they say. They make for a very tight junction, so there's almost no space, and nothing can get in between these cells. There are gap junctions, which are usually channels uh, that transport ions and molecules. And then there are adherence junctions, which is what we're going to talk about today, which is composed of coherence as a mechanosensitive um, Protein. I was, couldn't read it. It says broad functions, which we will, it's involved in development, proliferation. Many of those things that you heard about integrins being develop, uh, involved with, coherins are involved in many of those same events. So uh, this is a little diagram of some epithelial cells. And uh, the coherins are right over here, holding <laughs> these two cells to bet together. You can see actin filaments sort of. Uh, aligned with the coherins, we're going to talk about how that happens. You know what? I have to go back. I want to go back and say one thing that I just realized that I forgot. If you look at the focal adhesion, there are proteins in the focal adhesion that have actin binding domains. And some of those are vinculin, alpha actinin. There are several. But the, when those proteins get recruited to the focal adhesion, then the focal adhesion can bind to actin. And that's how actin gets organized or you know, nucleated at the focal adhesion.
Okay, and that's how changes in the ECM through integrins can regulate the actin cytoskeleton. Okay, so remember if we look at this picture, see these red actin filaments are touching the focal adhesions. That's because they are bound to these actin binding proteins that re get recruited into the focal adhesion. Okay, that's important because I want to tell you that cadherins in a different way do the same thing. They nucleate actin. So here's a diagram of what an adherence junction looks like. And the adhesion receptor is in green. That's the cadherin. Um, and the difference between cadherins and integrins in the, you know, the bird's eye view is that integrins are binding to extracellular matrix proteins. Cadherins are binding to another cadherin. And there are different cadherins. There is, for example, there's E cadherin, where E stands for epithelial. So the E cadherin is expressed on a lot of epithelial cells. N cadherin is broadly expressed, but the N stands for neural, because it was first found on a neural cell. E cadherin will only bind to another E cadherin. N cadherin will only bind to another N cadherin. So these cell populations self-sort depending on the types of cadherins that they express. Okay, cadherins, like integrins, have an extracellular domain, a transmembrane domain, here's the plasma membrane of the cell, and a cytosolic domain, and then this is the actin drawn here, and you can see these linkers from the cadherin to the actin, and that's what we're going to talk about. So cadherin binding is called homophilic because it's binding to itself. Integrins are sometimes called heterophilic binding. So here's a little more detail on what um, cadherins use to interact with actin. And there are really um, three players, uh, P120, beta-catenin, and alpha-catenin. Most of the attention has been on beta-catenin and alpha-catenin. And um, I think that's really, at, at this level, you need to remember perhaps that cadherins use catenins to interact with act, to transduce force whereas integrins use focal adhesions, focal adhesion proteins. And they, you know, alpha-catenin has actin binding domains. So cadherins bind to beta-catenin, beta-catenin binds to alpha-catenin, alpha-catenin can bind to actin. Okay, the same conceptual thing we saw in focal adhesions. You recruit proteins that eventually have an actin binding domain. <clears throat> so, here is a picture of uh, a focal adhesion, a simplified one. Here's FAC, here's SAR, Kindlin, and Talin. It binds alpha actinin here. Alpha actinin is binding to actin. The same concept we're seeing over here. And as um, alpha catenin actually can bind actin in two ways. One, it has a C terminal actin binding domain. Uh, the other way is that if it's stretched, it reveals in the middle of it, much like P130 cast, you stretch it, you reveal a cryptic binding domain, and that can recruit a molecule called vinculin, and vinculin can bind actin. So people in the field, right, right, they spend a lot of time thinking about what binding domain of alpha-catenin is more important, or when, or where. But basically, catenin binds actin, and it can do so better under force than in the absence of force. So if integrins bind actin and cadherins bind actin, here's the focal adhesion and here's the adherins junction, and here's the supposed to be a diagram of the two cells, um, the actin is actually can communicate between the extracellular matrix and the adherins junction. Right, so if you strength, there's a lot of interest in how does a cell, uh, can a cell change its mechanical information by changing the strength of a focal adhesion versus the strength of an adherence junction? Because there is this communication through actin between these two receptor subclasses. And it's also the true case for cadherins that if I pulled on a cell over here, that's, that force would be transmitted through this adherence junction into this cell, and this cell would feel the force even though the force was exerted over here. 
it very much is a chicken and egg problem. Yeah, and, and it's a self, and you can see how it's sort of a self amplifying loop, right? If you strengthen the actin cytoskeleton, you'll reinforce integrin clustering, which will strengthen the focal adhesion, which will bring in more things to bind. And the same thing is happening in the Heron junction. And when you have a loop, it's hard to know where you start. Where do you go in? You can go into the loop at multiple places. So disavow in your mind any notion of a linear pathway in this regard. How we actually initiate it can come in from multiple places and then we sort of have this amplification and you reach some level of homeostasis based on the rigidity of the matrix, based on the coherent representation in the cell. Okay, And then think about how those things can be perturbed by things like vasoconstrictors or growth factors or hormones. Holtz put soluble biochemicals and hormones on top of that and you can tweak that homeostatic relationship which ultimately changes signaling which ultimately changes transcription. So the heart is really complicated because the force, the, the cell, the, you know, the, the, the heart myocardium cells feels actually can change in every systole and diastole, right? Yeah, so it's like mind-bogglingly confusing in a way. Plenty for you to do. Yeah? Um, so when a cell sends a force and then causes a stiffening, what prevents it from going the other way? What is the other way? Softening or, or releasing these? Uh, uh, nothing, is, nothing is irreversible. So, um, you know, if there's a whole category, for example, of uh, enzymes called matrix metalloproteinases that degrade the extracellular matrix. And so if you start degrading the extracellular matrix, you can lower its rigidity and that will reverse a lot of these events that we're talking about. Because think about, you know, ultimately a lot of this comes down to chemistry and uh, just chemical reactions. So chemical reactions have a KD, right? So if you reduce force below a certain level, you're changing the dissociation constant of these focal adhesion interactions, and some will dissociate. None of these are covalent. They're all you know, non-covalent interactions with dissociation constants. If force goes down, you, you're below the threshold of some interactions, and they dissipate. If force goes up, then they reform. Okay, so remodeling of focal adhesions is a very big deal. And it's, it's, it's less well understood for adherence junctions, but you would think adherence junctions can remodel too. There, there's a, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to tell, I'll tell you a story later, but there's a whole biology about how adherence remodel. Just one more thing on that, like, is it most of, most of it because of cryptic uh, sites being exposed, so when you're actually going back, they wouldn't just like disappear, right? Like, so a lot, a lot of mechanobiology now seems to be, yeah, I wouldn't say all, but this was that thing I showed you with Cass about folded structures opening and revealing new cryptic information, that's really a fundamental paradigm. Yeah, so I'd say that's a really good principle to base your thinking on. But you said the KD, K, the KD is the major pair, but if the cryptic site is still exposed, it would... Well, okay, so the KD, I have a loose KD. So the KD of that folding unfolding um, may drive that, right? All right, and so, um, good, I'm, I'm sort of near the end. I, I, so just since we're talking about complexity, I'll just throw in one last thing, which is really exciting, but also, you know, problematic in the sense of, you know, but a challenging intellectual thing. There's a, there are some proteins that can live in the focal adhesion and in the adherence junction. And one of them, which I mentioned, is vinculin. Vinculin was identified as a major focal adhesion protein that binds actin. There, it's sensitive to force. Um, but recently, we have found that vinculin is also in the adherence junction. Remember when you open when you pull on alpha-catenin, it reveals a cryptic site that vinculin can bind to. There are specific tyrosine phosphorylation events of vinculin in the focal adhesion and in the 
um, adherence junction. So that means that what vinculin is in binding to through SA2 domains here and here is different, even though it can go in both populations. So when you talk about the balance of focal adhesions and adherence junctions and actin, you actually can imagine how proteins could shuffle back and forth between one and the other. So it really becomes quite fascinating at that level. And then finally, um, I want to talk to you about another group of proteins that you're going to hear a lot about in mechanobiology called Rho family GTPases. There are three of them. Uh, so Rho was, is what gave the family the name. Rho, RAC, and CDC42. And Rho, Rho GT, GTPases in general are different from kinases. They don't phosphorylate proteins, but they exist in an active state and an inactive state. And when they're in their active state, they bind to things, okay? the way SH2 proteins can bind a phosphotyrosine. So the conversion of Rho, RAC, or CDC42 from their active GTP bound state to their inactive GDP bound state uh, determines a lot of mechanobiology. Rho activity determines stress fibers working through a kinase called Rho kinase. RAC determines, I'll show you pictures of these, what's called lamellipodia. This is really important in motility. And CDC42 is in phy gives you a phylopodia. And let, I think we have pictures. Yeah, so these are stress fibers, these actin filaments that are connected to focal adhesions. This is what happens when you turn on rho in the cell. Uh, this, this actin, uh, this is hard to see in this picture, but imagine a cell that's like this that's curled over at the end, okay? That's what you're seeing at these things. You're seeing the edge, except now imagine that that thing is waving back and forth like a jellyfish. That's what's called a lamellipodia, and it sort of surveys the landscape and is involved in cell migration. That is mediated. This is all actin, what we're looking at here. That's mediated by rack, and then these spiky things are called phylopodia, and that's mediated by CDC42. And so when you cells sense a mechanical signal, either through compression, rigidity, stretching, whatever, these things are activated, not always to the same degree, um, and sometimes specificity among the family. And that is often what is dictating the rigidity of the actin cytoskeleton in certain locations. So here, the rigidity of the cytoskeleton is very different spatially from the rigidity of the cytoskeleton here. And um, oh, let me. So this is, these are those lamellipodia by rack. You can see these things on this cell really nicely. They're forming and they're surveying the landscape. And then the cell is moving with these active towards the, this is called the leading edge, these active lamellipodia. Huh, this was something I took from my lab. They're a fibroblasts, but these are fibroblasts that are genetically engineered to express a, a dye that binds to actin. So the reason you can see them like this is because they're what's called life act. It lets you isolate cells and visualize the actin. So here you can see the F actin filaments, but you can really nicely see the uh, lamellipodia. And here's a guy like stretches out, decides to come back. There's a whole bunch of surveying going on by these rho GTPases as cells move. And uh, in the last slide, of course, there are, it's not just the rho rack or CDC42, but these regulate a whole bunch of pathways in and of themselves and how these interact with focal adhesion proteins and adherence junction proteins is one of the main uh, areas of research these days. Okay, and I think, oh, Three drugs that you're going to hear a lot about, probably even in the retreat, that I just have to quickly mention. Y27632, blebistatin, and ML7. These are drugs everybody in mechanobiology uses to interrogate the Rho pathway. And with that, I'm just going to sort of pull it together that there, are, there is actin that lives um, associated with coherence and associated with integrins and focal adhesions and adherence junctions. Rho is regulating these F actin filaments. These actin fibers can be in coordination and link these two 
uh, categories of adhesion receptors. So rho contract, uh, stimulate the contractility, contributes to the clustering of integrins and maturation of focal adhesions. Uh, that can lead to outside-in signaling, which then can regulate rho. And then there's this whole issue of coherent integrin balance that we talked a lot about that is really one of the you know, more exciting questions about mechanotransduction right now. Okay, and thank you. And I'll take any other questions. We good? Oh, yeah. Do you generally see I think it's more of that loop thing. When you start an inside-out signal, it often will change the activation of integrins, which could change the way it recognizes ligands, which then would lead to an outside-in signal. So think of it as you know, just this crosstalk between the two. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that. I would say it's picanewton range, but I don't know the number. Paul might be a person to ask that question to, um, who should be here very soon. Uh, he was here, don't worry. Um, he's the third lecture. He's the third. Oh yeah, Ram is doing next. But yeah, um, he may have a, a better idea of that. Uh, but I would guess it's going to be picanewtons, but not one or two. Uh, so you know what I debated whether I don't so I don't know the answer to that question, but I can tell you the two principles. And I asked I was debating whether to talk about this concept, but since you asked, there are two kinds of mechanosensitive bonds that are called slip bonds and catch bonds. And catch bonds strengthen under force, and slip bonds weaken under force. So their KDs are force sensitive. Okay. So what you're really saying are these catch bonds or slip bonds is part of the answer to your question. Right? Are they going to strengthen, and how much force do you need? Um, I, I think Paul would also know better. I know integrins can be catch bond, are definitely, fibronect alpha 5 beta 1 interaction with the synergy site creates a catch bond. That I'm sure about. In fact, a former faculty member published that work. Um, I believe it's the same for coherence, but I'm not sure. This is uh, Ram logging in online. I just want to mention, I think uh, 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 Mike Hostad will probably talk about that one. Oh, yes, that's a good point. Uh, I think yeah. He did last year. Okay. In, 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 in fixed cells, or dead cells, you know, cells that we have studied, manipulated and then fixed, you use immunofluorescent microscopy. You know, um, for live cell imaging, if you want to see the, fo you know, I showed you like in the LIFE Act, act and, um, you can use focal adhesion proteins, you can in insert them into the cells when they have a fluorescent marker like GFP. Uh, that's a common way that you can visualize the localization of a protein at a focal adhesion or an adherence junction. All right, I better stop because it's time for the next.